Amen. The mission and vision of the church has not changed. Jesus came here Ooh. and he taught us to go into all the world and make disciples. Therefore, it's important for us to do what? Make disciples. It's not called the great suggestion. It's called the great commission. So you know what? We're going to do that. We're going to know God. We're going to grow deep. And we're going to go love the world. Room's off. Good morning, Heritage. How are we? Let's pray together. Father, we just want to thank you for what you're doing in this house and in this place. And right now, we willingly submit our lives to you. We surrender all that we are. We pray, Father, that right now you'd open up our hearts and minds to receive from your word. Any distractions that are in this place, Father, may you remove them. And may we open up ourselves to actually be changed by what you teach us through your word. Apart from you, God, we can do nothing, nor do we want to try. So we pray right now, Father, that um, you would even use me and my mouth and my tongue, not doing this on my own effort, will, my own wit, my own wisdom, but instead, Lord, may I humbly uh, surrender to you, empty me of, of anything that's in the way, Lord, and use my mouth to speak to your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said... Amen, amen, amen. So I want to welcome everybody here. Maybe some of you are brand new in this house. And we just want to say we're so glad you came. And if you're new online, maybe you've joined us all around the world. We just want to tell you we're glad that you're with us as well. And so I've met so many new people. I'm so fired up today. And that's for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is because my daughter got married this weekend. <laughs> Woo! I'm telling you, she looked like a princess, a real life. She was so gorgeous. I couldn't stop looking at her. She looked so beautiful, and we did it out on the lake. And man, there was a big storm on Friday night when the actual wedding came through in Sonoya and Peachtree City. But my wife was praying, and that storm went around this church. Praise God Almighty. So that was cool. Uh, but man, it was uh, an amazing day. Uh, that's us right before we walked down the aisle, and I was a hot mess. I mean, crying all day long. The worst part was whenever I um, did the first look. She came in the backyard, and she I was waiting. She tapped on my shoulder. I turned around, and it was just ugly. It was just slobbery snot everywhere and just <laughs> disgusting. But, man, I was so proud of her. And I have a new son, finally, right? I had all these women around. I finally have a boy. Thank God Almighty. So um, it really was a beautiful way. Many of you were there and helped me clean dishes and do cooking. And I just want to thank you for that. Set this place up. You would not have recognized this place. We did it out by the lake and then came in here for the reception. And it was just so beautiful. So, man, what a beautiful, beautiful day. So today we're in a series called This Is Us. And in this series we've been talking about sort of who we are. Like our, our heart as a family and what it means to be a family. And for me, this is really rich today because I have my family in the house, all on the front row here, my mom and dad. My dad has the glorious, massive beard like Duck Dynasty. And uh, yeah, he's the great commander. He's been my commander for years, and I honor you, Dad. I want to thank you for raising me up to love God and serve Jesus. You too, Mom. You did a good job. I turned out all right, it turns out. So um, I want to thank my family for being here. Uncle Phil, you've been one of the biggest voices in my life, and I can't thank you enough for the investment you've made into me. But it's beautiful to get to be here with my family and to talk about my new family, my new church family that um, sometimes in this life, you guys know this, that your church family is as close or closer than your actual blood. And so I, I'm believing that's going to happen here that many of you are going to become family. And so one of the things we've been talking about, I just want to make sure this is getting in your heart, is that we passionately love God and intentionally love people, right? That's our heart. And the way that we are going to serve this community is by knowing God, growing deep, and going and loving. And so that's the strategy. It's not different than anything that Jesus taught us. We're Jesus people who do Jesus things, right? We're Bible people that follow as close to the Bible as possible. So the vision and mission that I've come up with isn't like, wow, Blake, that's yours? No, it, came, it was from Jesus himself. 
He said to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So that's his great commandment, and the great commission is to go into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they come from Christ himself, and I hope that you guys will go, you know what, I can sink my teeth into that. I want to be a part of that. That's my mission, and that's my vision. And I heard somebody say this week, actually it was my own daughter, she said, man, I just love my church. I love my church. And I was like, come on, girl. I love you. It's awesome. So hopefully you feel that. Hopefully you have this vision and mission in, in your own heart. And you're starting to say, you know what? This is us. This is me. And this is mine. So we want to be the kind of people that um, really do fight for connection with each other. So today I want to talk about growing deep in relationship with God vertically, but also horizontally with people. And that's hard work. And so today we're going to talk about the importance of relationship with one another. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about one of our key values, our core values, is that we, we want to communicate this all the time, is that we are better together. Somebody say, preach that. Preach that. We're better together. Here's the way I like to say it. When we're unified, our efforts and talents are multiplied, right? So if we're working together, man, you can get a lot more done than trying to do it on my own. And so I want to see efforts multiplied here. And another thing that we say all the time is we believe the best. We believe the best in people. Uh, if you're in an argument, I want to challenge you to fight for connection because when we listen first by leading with questions, seeking to understand, and, and fighting for connection, we're going to be better together, right? So that's how we believe the best. We say, you know what, I'm going to fight for your heart. I'm going to believe the best that you're not against me, that we're for each other, and the problem isn't you. We're going to figure out the problem by sitting beside each other, and we're going to fight for connection. So today, I'd like to talk about the importance of connection. Everybody say connection. So I want to connect in relationships, and I want to talk about how they play a key role in experiencing life with other people and how that makes life so much better and richer. I'd like to start with something that we normally don't do around here. I'm going to read you a sonnet. It's going to be very romantic. So imagine us sitting down by a fire. We're at, at a cabin, and it's snowing outside, okay? And so we're going to sit down together, and it's like this incredible setting. I'm going to read you something that I think is so great. You guys ready? Okay, here we go. This is called Friendship by Diana something something. I can try to say it, but I just mess up. It sounds so dumb. I'll try. Maria Malloy Crake. I think that's how you say it. Anyways, here's the, here's, here's the sonnet. Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person. Having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but pouring them all right out, just as they are, chaff and grain together, certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them and keep what's worth keeping and with the breath of kindness blow the rest away. Oh, man, that's so good. That was just good. So I, I think all of us in this life we, we long to have the kind of friend that, like, makes you feel safe. And, and when you're talking, you can just talk completely, you know, from the hip. Just gut. Just, like, comfortable. You're not measuring, how do I say this? I don't want to offend, right? You're, you're not, like, trying to say it in the right way. It's just, like, verbally vomiting. <laughs> right? Just, like, here it is. And... Then to have a friend that knows you well enough that they actually see you and they help you see you, right? So that when they hear you say how you're feeling, they, they keep what's worth keeping and then they take the stuff that's lies and not truth and they just let that blow away. I think all of us want a friend like that. And maybe you've never experienced that kind of love and intimacy. But when you have that kind of connection with someone, it can't be manufactured after that. When you've had the kind of person that really listens to you, 
sees the good and helps the bad go away and then helps you find yourself, man, that's rich. Especially when they're doing it in the power of the Spirit of God. And they help you kind of see the identity that God's made you to become. That's, that's the best part of life. And for me, this, this weekend, you want to talk about rich. I just feel so rich. Because I have some of the best friends in the world. And I had six different states represented here this weekend from all the different ministries that I've had throughout my life. And so I just felt so crazy loved. My wife and I just had some of the best conversations. People from Georgia and Tennessee and Kentucky and Colorado, Oklahoma, and, and even Florida. People from all over the country were here. People that I've had really hard stuff together with. They've seen me in my worst and my best, and they love me anyways. One of my friends' name was Carlos Whitaker, and he came, and his wife served us just so beautifully. She did all the decorations for this church, and she just had this vision to make it happen, and she was just amazing. But she only poured into us because, you know, we've been a lot of stuff together. We've been through the hardest parts of life. And because of that, man, our bond is thick. we thick as thieves, man. And um, I'll tell you what happened. We were on staff together, and my friend Carlos was unfaithful to his bride. And she came straight to our house when she found it on the computer. She came and sat down in my bedroom, my floor, and said, I need you to look at this computer. Tell me what's on there. I said, man, it's bad. What do you want to know? It's all there. He, he's having an affair. And she said, that's all I need to know. Go get my kids. So I drove over to his house. I said, Carlos. He knew. He sat down with the kids and said, you got to go away for a long time. I don't know when I'll see you again. And I took the kids away from him. After a few weeks, she wanted her house back. So she said, go get Carlos. Kick him out. I'm going home. So I came and got Carlos and said, she's coming back and you're out. And he came and lived with me for six months. He was in the bedroom beside my girls. And we talked about all that he'd done wrong. At first he was resisting. He's like, I don't even care, man. Whatever. I don't. And then as time went on, he started seeing how arrogant and foolish he'd been. And we started working on him and speaking life. And he started doing some Bible studies. And he started getting into counseling. And he started um, talking about his wounds from his past that's caused him to continually be in this cycle of bad decisions. And man, you talk about intentionally loving someone. It was nothing but a bunch of work. And we dove in deep to help them heal. And you won't believe what happened. I watched that man turn into a different human. The old was gone and the new creation came. And my man was lit on fire with the Holy Spirit. And since that time, he's written four books. And his last one was called Kill the Spider. And it's sold 75,000 copies. And now he's literally an international speaker and author. And God's using him more profoundly than you would have ever dreamed or imagined. But it's because he was in the fiery furnace of melting away his dross and his chaff. And seeing him himself be purified into the image that God had planned from the beginning. And because he took the time to allow other people to fight for connection in him with God and with other people, he learned the importance of being intentional with his bride. And he fought for her heart. And he won her back over time. And they are crazy happily married. And their kids are stronger and more in love with Jesus than they've ever been. So that's what it means. Amen. Praise God. That's what it means to passionately love God, intentionally love people. It's hard work. It's hard work. But when you're passionate about God, the intentionality just happens. You're going to take the time to have the hard conversation. When you see dross and you see chaff inside of other people, you've got to speak into it. And that's, that's what it means to be uh, the church. It's what it means to say, this, this is us, man. We're going to work on each other. We're going to take the time to see each other and help you 
see you. So having a friend like that is the single most important thing to bring satisfaction and contentment to your life. Being connected to people really is the best part of life. But let's admit it, it's also the very hardest part in this life. Somebody say preach. Because here's the deal. Every single one of us have a little bit of crazy. Every one of you, I'm just going to say it, you're a hot mess. And I'm a hot mess. And so that, that means that we have to fight, fight for connection. It's exhausting to do that kind of work because we don't play well with others. And so a, a lot of the Bible speaks into that. This book is like, hey, children, here's the deal. You got to learn to like, you know, get along. You got to learn to, you know, talk. The Bible says, hey, let's be kind. Don't judge. Let's stop biting. And in fact, there's this great verse in Galatians chapter 5 that says, but if you bite, <laughs> like it's an option, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. So you can be consumed by people. They eat you. Apparently in Galatia, they had a problem with biting people. And so they, they, you see this sort of idea like, you know what, maybe we need to make the t-shirt. Hide your kids, hide your wife, people bite. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I, I have experienced uh, the pain of like someone maliciously wanting to hurt me. And, and they intentionally bite me. And um, it's, it's awful when that happens with the people that are closest with you. But it does. You get in a grow group, here's the deal. You're going to be bitten. And it's learning to fight for connection after you're bitten that we have to work at. And so, um, for me, my wife and I were recently riding a bike together, speaking of being bitten. And we were in Florida. And my sweet bride went on ahead of me because we had stopped. And I said, go ahead, I'll catch up. And she goes around the corner, and she comes upon a massive snake. I'm talking this thing stretched across the eight-foot path. It was like at least eight foot long. And I'm talking like this big around, eastern rattleback snake, right? So uh, rattle, did I say that right? I didn't say that right. Eastern diamondback rattlesnake, thank you. Figured it out. We're learning to talk here today. So it was this massive snake, and my wife literally has to swerve around it when she comes upon it. And I would think that my precious bride, when she sees that, would immediately go, oh, I need to let Blake know. <laughs> He's coming around the corner. He's going to be going fast. So I'm going to jump off my bike and say, Blake, watch out. Stop, honey. Slow down. Don't, there's a snake. You, you would think she would do that. That's not what she did. She gets off of her bike, she pulls out her phone, and she starts laughing. She's like, <laughs> my husband's coming around the corner, he's fixing to run over a snake, and I'm going to catch it on video. What kind of a person does that? So I come around the corner, <laughs> and I saw the snake, and I slowed down, and I like get off my bike, and I pull out my phone too, because like, that's amazing. And after I tinkled myself just a little bit, it was humongous. But um, yeah, people bite. People bite. And helping people feel safe with you in an environment where often people can turn on each other and strike. It's important that we give this sense of belonging no matter what. Uh, to make people go, you know what, the best gift that I can give you is to help you understand that we're going to love one another. That we're, no matter what, no matter how bad you hurt me, I'm going to love you anyways. In fact, Pastor Mike Rapp, when he got here, he was like, I'm excited about being hurt and figuring out how to work through that hurt. Sometimes that's what the church needs to be able to say. That, man, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through it. No matter how bad or mad you are, we're going to get through it. And so making people go, I'm, I'm, we're going to fight for one another. In fact, 
I don't know if you've ever done a study in the Bible of the one another passages, but it's a really great study. There's actually 59 references in the Bible to one another passages where it teaches us to encourage one another, to greet one another, to help one another, to serve one another, making peace with one another, forgiving one another, loving, speaking the truth to one another. And every one of those verbs have like these supporting passages that come along with that thought. So it's a great study about learning to love horizontally. And we're not great at that. But the world will know you're a Christian by your love. And how well you love horizontally will directly communicate how you love vertically. If you stink and suck at this, nobody's going to believe that you love this way. And so the reality is a lot of times we, we aren't great at loving this way. But I think it's the litmus test for how well you love God. Don't tell me how much you love God. Show me by loving people. And that's what we're going to do this Saturday when we go love day, aren't we? We're going to serve in five different locations. That's because you already filled up the first three, so we had to add two more. So we're going to go love this city in a big way. I have t-shirts on and we're going to bring heaven to earth. God's always wanted us to love one another. In fact, I would say we're hardwired by God to depend on others. And for those of you that um, have like a control issue, you're control freaks, to say that you depend on each other just made you break out in hives. Because we like to say, I do it on my own, right, Dad? From the time I was this big. Daddy, I do it by myself, right? He's trying to pick strawberries. Dad, you can't pick strawberries as good as me. I'm picking strawberries. <laughs> Anyways, when you're a kid, you'll never hear a, say, hear a kid say this. You know, I just really want to be a recluse when I grow up. <laughs> you won't hear that. No, we, 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 we want to play with each other. When we're little, there's, there's not been damage yet. And so we just play with each other. We have a blast playing with each other, don't we? Like we, we just love to be loved and love to love. And there's, not, there's freedom. We dance and have fun. And like for me, I, I ride bikes everywhere. And I had an awesome GT Performer with the gyro. You guys remember those? It was an awesome bike. It was cooler than everybody else's. And we'd ride all over town. And we'd do the jumps and build tracks. And it was just awesome. And for me, I also loved Star Wars figures. And we'd play out in the backyard playing with Star Wars figures forever. And, and playing Nintendo. I loved it, especially Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. That was amazing. So we'd play these for these hours, hours and hours with our friends, not, not paying attention to the time and not worrying about being hurt because we just loved each other, right? But then, eventually, as a kid, you, you play dodgeball. And you get smashed in the face. And you're like, what? Well, I loved you. Why did you smash me in the face with the dodgeball? And you realize, oh, man, dude, maybe I need to, wait a second. These people can actually hurt me. And then we start growing up, don't we? And we start building our walls. And we start pushing people back. Because you're going to be betrayed if I get close to them. If I get too close, then, then you know what? I'm going to barricade myself. I'm going to make some massive walls so you can't be too close so you won't hurt me. And we get jaded. And we become apathetic. And, and let me tell you something. When we choose apathy, apathy says, man, I don't even care what you think. And that's the biggest lie ever. We all care. What other people think deeply we're made we're hardwired to care and so to say that's just like you're lying to yourself we, we say things like ah oh, you know what it doesn't even matter you know what? i'm done with him i sure am praise god almighty he never said that about me we're not done with people well, with at what point you say i'm done with the child of god you don't we're not done with each other. And sometimes, sometimes we aren't even aware that we're making these changes. We're subconsciously saying, I'd rather be alone than allow people to be too close to, to cause me pain. And we're just trying to turn the switch off to our feelings and seek self-protection. I get that. I'm a church leader. I understand self-protection. 
And I understand wanting to build a white tower and climb up in it. Nobody's close to me. That's no way to live, though. And pastors that do that, they're wrong. You, you shouldn't seclude yourself from the people around you that love God and loving people is, is hard, hard work. And so apathetic thinking says, I'd rather push people away than fix what's broken. But can I tell you something, church? I came to this church knowing it's broken, and I'm here to fix something. In the name and the power of Jesus, for his glory, we're going to fix it. It's going to be all right. We're going to fix this place, and we're going to do it by loving each other and loving each other well and learning to listen because that's how it happens, right? And so we, we all need to belong. And this, this has become a real problem in America. 50% of Americans say that they've never felt more alone. We are more connected online than ever before. And we see each other's lives online. We see the pictures and we know what people are going through. But you don't know them. And we're, we're less connected than we've ever been. And so that's, that's a real problem. We desperately need each other. And that's why we're so infatuated with social media and, and seeing each other. That's why we love to be online and watch other people more than anything else. But we're not actually known and that's, that's awful. Here's the deal. It, it opens up all kinds of other problems when nobody really knows you. I mean, serious problems. It opens up like, like, like all kinds of things that are bad reflection of who God is. Because God, Jesus didn't come here and he didn't stonewall people, did he? He didn't say, oh, I'm not even going to listen to you. He didn't say, don't talk to me. You can talk, but I'm not going to talk back. <laughs> I don't see that in the Bible. Do you? He didn't say, hey, I'm going to block your call. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Our attitude and countenance communicates your disinterest. Do you, do you talk to people sometimes and you can just see kind of on their face? They don't have to say anything to you. But they're saying everything to you. They're saying, I don't even like you. I'm talking to you, but <clears throat> keep my distance. You're crazy. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we disconnect uh, right here. And you're communicating 90% of what you want to say. We need to pay attention to my countenance. I need to pay attention when I'm talking to my wife, what this is saying. And sometimes I'll even say, hey, honey, don't pay attention to this. Pay attention to my words because I'm trying to get this to catch up with my mouth and my heart. <laughs> don't I, Allie? She's like, amen. <laughs> Maybe some of you at home are disconnecting in a real way with your own kids because you're so distracted by your phone, trying to pay attention to some technology online like they're more important on this right here than the kids that are pulling on your, your sleeve see it's important man that we fight for connection um in 2010 i uh went with three guys to africa to a place called tanzania and we decided to climb mount kilimanjaro it was hard and it was cold and i will never do it again it was just stupid. Um, it's 15 degrees below zero at the top and 50% oxygen that I have down here. And uh, to give you an idea of how tall that is, the tallest mountains in the Rocky Mountains are 14,000 feet. So this is 19,340 feet. So it's, it's a mile higher than anything in the States. And so, man, when we got to the top, I was like, this is just dumb. There's a camp called Barafu Camp, which means ice in Swahili. And um, I was freezing. I had five layers of clothing on. And I was trying to take oxygen. And um, it was, it's gross. Your body does weird things when you get that high. Because your altitude sickness, it just starts messing with you. And so I had what I'll affectionately refer to as Code Brown. And um, I was on the toilet a lot. And um, I, I also... Uh, something happened the night before I climbed up this mountain that was really unfortunate. You're so cold you don't want to get out of your sleeping bag and so you, you actually pee in a bag. 
Well, I put that pee bag beside my sleeping bag and it got a hole in it the night before and my soaking my sleeping bag soaked it all up. So I was sleeping in my own urine. It was fantastic. It was so wonderful. And so um, I'm having asthma problems and my wife knows that the worst day of this whole trip is actually summit day. And that's when you go from 15,000 to 19,3. And so I want to communicate this trip to you the way that my wife saw this trip instead of the way that I saw the trip. And so my bride knew that I had prepared to climb this for over a year, and she knew that the hardest part of the trip was actually summit day. So she was very, very concerned on summit day. The day before I climbed summit day, I told her all the complications I was having. I told her that I was a lot slower than the other two guys, and that they actually were talking about going on summit day alone that they were going to send me by myself because I was so slow. Um, Why are you laughing at that? I I actually, I'm not kidding. They they had me get up at 3 a.m. and climb out in the dark, and they didn't want to do that, so they left at like 6.30 or so. So I was three and a half hours slower than them, and we actually arrived at the top at the exact same time. But that day was horrible for me. These guys that left America with me, we flew across a big body of water, got to Africa, the hardest day of my life, and they're like, hey man, do it by yourself. Like, I love you so much. You're wonderful. Okay, thank you. So I got up and I started up this mountain by myself, 15 below zero. And I was so cold I couldn't feel my hands. And this guy Elias, he's like, he's like, you know, Pastor Blake, do not pay attention to the cold. The cold is nothing. Pay attention to your breathing. The sun will rise in one hour. And I was like, I'm going to roll your face down this mountain. I mean, not pay attention to the cold. It is 15 degrees below. I am miserable. I can't feel my toes. I can't even talk. When I got to the top of the mountain, I had prepared this massive speech. I was all fired up about it. I'm going to tell my girls how much I love them. I'm going to tell them whatever they try to achieve in this life, they can do it. So I get to the top, and I can't think. I don't have any oxygen. I get there, and nobody's going to ever see this video. (laughs) I sounded so dumb. They have this video, and I'm like, I mean, you can't even understand it. I just sound like an idiot. I tried my hardest, but it didn't work out. So... My wife, the day of that climb, when I start going up that mountain, I had done a great job of communicating with her the whole trip. I was sending a text. I was I had this satellite thing called the spot, and I was pushing this button. She was literally on a computer watching me make my way up the mountain by pushing the spot and pushing the spot. She was watching. 36 hours, she heard nothing from me. The day before I did the hardest day of my life, she knew I was doing it by myself, and she, I went dark. I went completely dark. She went to this place in her mind of like, uh, okay, so I need to move in with dad. I'm going to sell the house. I got to get a job. My life's over. How am I going to tell my kids? That's where she was. And so she didn't know that I had gotten really sick. I got a really bad case of laryngitis. I couldn't talk. But that still didn't give me permission to stop communicating with the one that I love the most. Just to say, hey, I'm alive. (laughs) I had no idea she had gone to crazy town, but she went to crazy town. Have you ever had somebody in your life go dark? Like, really, you were fine. Like, everything was great. We communicate, we talk, we love each other. Then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, uh, are you okay? Like, what happened? We were good. Maybe you were dating somebody, and all of a sudden, nothing. Maybe it is a spouse, and it just gets quiet. You walk in, and you're like, I didn't realize I had made you mad. Or maybe you did know, and you just both sort of drift apart. It's so easy to do that, isn't it? Like We disconnect so much easier than we connect. And that's why I call it fighting for connection, man. Because you have to scrap for it. 
You have to work hard and be very, very intentional to help each other find intimacy. There's a number of times in my life that I've done this, that I've chosen to disconnect, and I've pushed people and God away from the table. I had a season in my life that I'll never forget where I was, I was partying hard. And man, I didn't want to hear what anybody had to say. I pushed my mom and dad away. I pushed my closest Christian friends away. And I just wanted to go for it. Whatever this life had to give, man, I was going to do it. I was going to be crazy. I was going to party like mad. Just hedonism. Just whatever felt good, yeah, let's do that. And so I, I'll never forget one of my closest friends that just was crazy in love with God named John Davis. He said, man, Blake, I need to talk to you. I didn't want to talk to him. I knew what he had to say. He said, let's meet at Penn Square Mall. You and I are going to have a long conversation. God told me something. I need to speak to you. And we sat there in that mall. And I cried. And I told him all that I'd done. I confessed the things that I was most ashamed of. And he showed me the love of God. He expe I experienced God's grace by the way that he loved me back. In a very real way, I understood who God was because of the way that he embodied the presence of God. And then he helped me see me and what I was actually doing and how I was disconnecting from all the people that loved me the most. And I believe with all my heart that that night in that parking lot at the mall, he saved my life. Because I was headed down a path that could have led to the rest of my life being destructive. But instead, he helped me come to life in God. He helped me choose to walk in the Spirit. And here's, here's what I've learned about learning to depend on each other. Is that there's all kinds of very real benefits of loving well and being loved well. Like real. Like spiritually, you are connected more. Emotionally, you're connected more. Physically, you actually get healthier when you're loved by people and by God well. And so here's, here's what I've learned. People don't just hurt you. They also heal you. People heal you. In a very real way, some of the most powerful moments I've had have been with people that have spoken life over me and helped me understand my identity in Christ, and I came to life because of them. That's, that's where the church comes in. Man, this is our job. It's up to us to show the world what belonging actually looks like. The world doesn't know that. Until you've experienced belonging with God, you can't help other people know what it feels like to belong. And so once you have experienced the belonging and intimacy of the Father God, you can't help but show the world what it feels like to have the belonging and love of the Father God through you. It happens. You just naturally love people when you've been loved by God. And that's why belonging is so beautiful when it's done right. It's this ancient practice in the church, and in some respects, we've lost the art of it. See, our worldview is inherited from our culture, from the people around us, and from the way that people engage one another. And Western minds especially here in the, the West, we teach individualism over community. And that's really weird. Like throughout history, identity was always found in and through our community. Our families and our tribes were known by we, not me. People's individuality weren't really even considered until like the past hundred years. And so people had a much deeper and richer experience of living and loving because they understood connectivity and belonging by the tribe that they were a part of. And in the Bible, I think it's very important, we miss this, that there's over 4,500 times when the original Greek and Hebrew, it actually teaches that the word you is plural. But our English interpretation makes it singular. 
which could lead us to thinking very individualistically, right? That it's directed at me when it's written to we and about we and the church as a community. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And so you hear, do you not know the Spirit's in you, right? It should read, do y'all know that y'all are a temple of God and the Spirit dwells in y'all. The literal interpretation of that is that all of you together are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is among you all. Or as we say in South Georgia, all y'all. That's actually a better understanding of that text. And so there's, there's one body found in many temples. I'm preaching today, man. We, we are the dwelling place of God. The new sanctuary is found in many. In other words, we all contribute to the body of Christ, the church. And here's the cool part. The Spirit of God connects us like glue to one another, which unifies us into one living organism. And this has the same understanding of how Jesus is our husband and we're his bride and we're actually glued together and we become one. And the best parallel of understanding of this teaching is that it's found in the essence of marriage. Because I don't know how God does that, but he makes a covenant with two people being meshed together and you become one in this divine way. And a husband and wife, they're glued together inside of a covenant. And when we cleave to our spouse, that word literally means unified or glued to something. It's a binding promise. A husband and a wife turning into one person. That's weird. It's awesome. It's strange. And the world doesn't understand that. But that's the way we should cleave to the church you choose. Stop bouncing and dating every church in town. Maybe it's time you say, I'm, I know that love without sacrifice is a lie, so I'm going to sacrifice for my bride. You can't say, I love Jesus and not love the church. If you love Jesus, loving the church is loving the bride. And you got to love it big and hard and work through your stuff together because we, we're one. We're unified. And we're glued together by the power of the Holy Spirit. And whether I like it or not, your mess is my mess. Your jacked up head is my problem. <laughs> and we're going to work on it together. <laughs> Right? So unfortunately, many of us are guilty of treating our spouse and the church like it's a marketplace. We just consume. We take what I want and whatever is best for me. I'm in this for me. I'm going to take what I need and you're going to feed me. Wife and pastor, you're going to feed me. That's why I came here. It's not my problem to feed you. You feed. We're consumers, man. We, we, we take what we need instead of recognizing it's my job to place the other, place the other before me. See, the Bible teaches that husbands are to go lay down their lives for the bride just as Christ laid down his life for the church. And we're Jesus people who do Jesus things, so we're called to lay down our life for the church. When we do that, we build a beautiful relationship that creates belonging for all who come into this house. People walk up in here and be like, y'all are weird. What's up with all the love? Y'all crazy. But it's because we got this connectivity. We're glued by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus died, his spirit dwells in us and we're glued to the church. And now he is leaving it up to us to model to the world what Christ looks like inside of each of our collective earthly temples. So how cool is it to say that Christ in you and me is the hope of glory, which really should read Christ in all y'all is the hope of glory. Church, you, me, we are the hope of glory. It's, it's really beautiful. So the American statement that says, united we stand, that's really not American. 
That's God's terms. Because you can't stand alone. And you were never made to stand alone. We're supposed to stand side by side, united and glued together by the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on. Depending on each other really isn't an option. In a very literal sense, I can't do this without you. Because you are a part of me and we are created equal in Christ Jesus who's the head. So, I mean, it is an option. Like, you, you know people that have done what I did when I was young and I pulled away. I didn't want to hear what the church had to say. I knew what you were going to say. And so maybe you know somebody in your life that said, man, I can't be a part of that church no more. It's a mess. I'm not going to go anymore. Maybe you should step into that. And say, hey, uh, where you been? Is there somebody that the Holy Spirit's putting on your mind right now? Can I challenge you to say, hey, you know what? Come back. Be part of our body again. You know you belong. This is family. This is home. This is us. I I've been doing that. With a lot of people that have left. I'm trying to try and heal and restore in the name of Christ, for his glory. We're going to get healthy again. And so I just want to tell you that choosing to disconnect, you can. But man, that's not the Jesus way. And his way is so much better. And being connected, you know, he asked us to be connected to the vine. Can you imagine if you like had a vine and you just ripped it apart and you're like, I'm going to be a branch that's out here by myself. I don't need that vine no more. What's going to happen to that vine? You know, it's not going to have nutrients. It's not going to have life. It's going to wither up and die. And it's going to go away. Jesus never wanted us to do this on our own. He wanted us to do it connected to the vine. In fact, let me hear you read together John 15 the way he says that. He says, remain in me and I will what? I'll remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And then listen to these words that Jesus said. This is a little bit of crazy talk. He said, yes, I am the vine. Can you imagine being at lunch with somebody and say, man, it's so nice to meet you. I'm the vine. What up? You'd be like, you're crazy. I'm the vine, and you know what you are? You're the branch. This is what Jesus said. You're the branch... And those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do what? A whole lot of nothing. See, here, here's the thing. Connection is dependency. Connection is dependence. We depend on each other. It hurts to even say that. But I need you. Can you just, can you just turn to the person beside you and say, I need you. I need you. We, we need each other desperately. And if I'm honest with you, that makes me uncomfortable. Because we all want to do it all on our own, in my own way. We need Jesus and we need each other and we're dependent on that. So I'm glad to announce to you this. I'm glad to announce that I have a very dysfunctional, codependent relationship with Jesus and all y'all. And I'm okay with it. <laughs> Belonging comes from connection. And only know, you know if you're really connected. Are you connected? Do people know you? Do they know all the stuff you're going through? If you don't have that, we want you to. I, I want you to find a group here. Get, get connected with some people that you can grow with. Because we want everyone here to be rooted. And here's the deal. Maybe this church has been dry and weary. But here's what I know about any tree or plant. When it's dry and weary, the roots grow deeper. And so some of you have grown deep recently. And, and there's some things that are fixing to just burst forth with fruit. Because you grew deep in the dry season. And so I want you to grow deep. And if you're, you're not connected to a group, we want you to get involved with Rooted. And this is going to teach you how to love well, how to love each other, how to love God. It's going to teach you how to tell your story. 
It's going to teach you how to be vulnerable and honest. And it's going to be a place where you're safe. You're safe. You're not going to be bitten. So I want to challenge you to be in. If you're not in a group, I want to challenge you to. Because here's the deal. It's more important to us that you're sitting in circles than in rows. We want you face to face with each other. Knee to knee. Listening, hearing, and helping each other become who Christ intended you to become. Than just hearing me lecture and feed you. Okay? That's, that's not bad. You're not doing anything wrong. But we value more intimacy with one another. So, how, how, you guys have heard about all the ways to get connected. And I, I'll tell you, for me and my wife, last year we were part of a, a group that was amazing. We got to know them all year long. And by the end of the year, we knew each other's stuff. We walked through marriage stuff, walked through kids stuff, we walked through job stuff. And man, we were like, you know what, we should do something together. Let's, let's go to Mexico. And so this last July, my entire group went to Mexico and we installed a wood shop together and helped some people. And it was so beautiful and rich. And that's what I want to challenge you to do. It, this coming Saturday, find some people that you can serve with. Maybe it is your grow group. Or maybe it's somebody that's far from God. And you can just say, hey, man, come with us. We're going to go serve and love on people. We're going to help the poor. We're going to help people eat. And we're going to do some stuff that's going to be really cool. They'll come along for that. So use it as a tool. So make sure and go love with us this Saturday. But here's the thing. You guys have heard a lot about disconnection and the importance of like, you know, fighting for a connection. And I want to challenge you to go from like, maybe, maybe right now you're at 3G and it's time to go to LTE. <laughs> right? And so um, here's, here's the ways that I want to challenge you to do that in closing. I want us to fight against apathy, cynicism. Don't allow your heart to become jaded. Fight apathy. I want you to study scripture with other people so you'll grow and be rooted. I want you to take a risk by dare, I dare you. I dare you to be authentic. I dare you to tell the real story of how you're really feeling with someone else. I, I want to challenge you to stop stonewalling. Let's work towards open and honest communication. I need you to be real, man. We're going to be real up in here, okay? I also want to challenge you to be unified and treat others as more important than yourself. So there's your challenge, church. It's not like rocket science. This, this really is simple stuff. Just love God and love people. Will you guys pray with me? Father, we passionately love you and we want to work better at intentionally loving other people. We're not great at that and we repent we repent, God, of the times that we're mean and we're harsh and we're quick to be angry and we're, we're, we're sharp with our tongues and we speak death instead of speaking life. God, help, help us to be more intentional. Help us to not go dark, but instead to constantly fight for connection and love and intimacy because that's how we'll look more and more like you. That's really our goal. We want to become more like you, Jesus. And so, Father, would you shape us? Would you mold us into a new church? Would you help us become a new creation? That the old would be gone and the new would come. We pray for revival in this land. We pray for a, a movement that you would come and breathe your Holy Spirit into us and that we would be filled to overflowing with passion, with love, and that God would... Just manifest yourself inhabiting our temples and that all of us together would be glued by the power of your Holy Spirit to love like never before. God, we love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's in your name we pray.